Hey guys, we are the Latter-day Disciples. Our team is dedicated to helping you boldly live the gospel, recognize the signs of the times, and prepare for the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us in our mission through our daily and weekly podcast series, connecting with us on social media, and visiting latterdaydisciples.com. We pray you are enlightened and empowered through this podcast episode. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I'm excited to be here with Cheryl Bruno. Cheryl has lived in 14 of the United States and now resides in the magnificent Monterey Bay area of California. She is an independent researcher in Mormon studies and co-author of Method Infinite, Freemasonry, and the Mormon Restoration, as well as a forthcoming biography on William Marx. Her wide interests have led her to publish scholarly articles, personal essays, poetry, and even a deck of Mormon-themed tarot cards. She has raised eight children and reigns over 20 grandchildren. I love that word, reigns. You are the matriarch of your family. So beautiful. I love that. (laughs) So Cheryl, thank you so much for joining. Before we get into your story, I I realize that I want to give a little bit of background because we're using this episode as kind of a part two of a previous conversation that we started with Michelle Stone. And that conversation was really interesting for me to see um, kind of the response to. So for a little bit of background for our listeners, I know a lot of people were really curious as to why I had Michelle on the podcast. Um, First off, I didn't really know a ton about Michelle being um, sort of a controversial character. Um, I had heard some of her work and I found several of the things that she presented on very interesting and enlightening and true in a lot of regards. And so we had a conversation and in the part one, we didn't even really touch on the topic of polygamy. It was all very much centered more on the ideas of women and priestesshood. And she shared some really beautiful things uh, that I think are are very true. Uh, she also shared some things that I don't agree with. And frankly, that happens with every single one of my guests. Um, so we published that episode and we got a lot of pushback and there was a lot of hurt. There was a lot of, um, a lot of people upset. And I was really sad to see that it was kind of a dramatic week. (laughs) There was a lot going on. Um, and I went to the Lord about it and kind of asked his guidance on it because again, that was a part one of a conversation. We thought we were going to have more. And, um, the direction that the Lord gave me is that this was turning into a learning opportunity for me and for those of our audience who are willing to kind of take this opportunity and that it was less about the subject matter of polygamy or even Michelle and, and, and her research. And it was more about the first part of the title of that episode, which is seeking truth. And how is it that we can seek truth out of all places and do it fearlessly and do it boldly and do it in a way that has confidence in our savior, Jesus Christ. And with the understanding that he will correct us, that he will guide us and that it's okay that we're all in these different places. So to that end, I wanted to invite another voice on for the second part of this episode. Um, someone who has actually opposing views, the opposite views of what Michelle has when it comes to polygamy, Cheryl, you believe that Joseph Smith instigated polygamy, that he participated in polygamy, um, kind of supporting the narrative or, or the information that we're given as we're growing up in the church. Right. And you're, and you're a, you call yourself a hobbyist historian. Is that correct? Um, I started as a hobbyist historian. I like to think that I'm more, uh, I have more validity now. (laughs) I would say so. I, I do have, um, probably, um, one of the, um, I, I feel like I'm one of the major voices in Mormon history now because I, do have um, a series of articles out in uh, major journal of the Mormon journals. And I will now have in the next few months, I will have three books that I've written on Mormon history that have been published by, um, by signature books and by covert books. And so um, I feel like I have a little more validity than the hobbyist historian, but I do not have a PhD. And so, you know, I'm not really in, I, I feel solidly grounded in academia, but um, I, without the education, you know, I, 
sort of have to say I'm hobbyist, maybe. Right. It, it may or may not add a level of validity, <laughs> right? De <laughs> depending, may or may not. I really mean that. I think it depends in every situation. Sometimes it's beneficial. Sometimes it's an additional level of, you know, in indoctrination <laughs> at times, at times, perhaps. So um, I, I really appreciate you being willing and open and, and um, very transparent with that background. But I think you're right. I think I find that you have a great deal of credibility. Uh, Cheryl and I have been able to have some conversations offline about some of the topics that she studied, particularly Joseph Smith's involvement with Freemasonry. And that was an incredibly enlightening conversation. You're very much on top of this literature. So I wanted, again, I wanted to invite you into this conversation and, and not so much to talk about polygamy again, because we didn't, as I said, we didn't really even talk about that with Michelle. Um, but I do want to hear your thoughts on seeking truth, exploring truth, um, and maybe even perhaps a little bit of your background with Michelle, because you and her have done a couple of episodes together now. Um, and I feel like your approach to her is quite unique from what other historians, church administrators, church people often feel when they approach her. And again, I'm not, I don't want to make this episode about Michelle. I want to really focus in on the principles. And I feel like from what I've seen from you, you have a really great handle on some on some foundational principles that I think we could all apply to take this approach and, and again, seek truth out of, out of all these places. So with that being said, would you mind sharing a little bit more of your story, your involvement in some of these, um, these extra conversations that are coming up and how you've been approaching them in a way that is informing you and, and also allowing you to inform others. Okay. Oh, well, I'll start way back. Um, and really my beginnings with Mormonism um, started when I was 19 years old and I was in college and um, I was sort of, um, I guess you'd call me an evangelical Christian, um, even though I wasn't real, um, that, you know, there were times in my life when I was like, oh, you can't play face cards, you can't go to dances and things, but other times I was sort of, you know, more um, relaxed about things, but I do have that background of you know, since childhood, reading scriptures since childhood, and, um, you know, ha I, I was very conversant with, like, King James language, so, um, so I, I love the scriptures, and um, a friend of mine who was in college with me um, went to her bishop one day and said, I'd like to go on a mission, and he said, no, I don't feel right about you going on a mission, mm -hmm. and she said, well, I'm not married, I'm, you know, getting older, and I really would like to go on a mission, he said, no, I don't feel right about that, she went home, she prayed about it and, you know, went about for a month or two. And then she went back to the bishop and said, no, I really want to go on a mission. And he said, don't, I don't feel right about you going on a mission. And so she went home and she thought she was just devastated. And she thought, okay, if I can't go on a mission, I'm going to look around and see, you know, who I can convert here mm -hmm. at Greensboro College in North Carolina. And she thought that I would make the best Mormon out of anyone <laughs> in the college. So she um, started sharing the gospel with me. And I did end up joining the church um, quite soon after that. And so um, at, and a little over a year later, went on a mission myself. And so I sort of felt like um, I shared my mission with her because, mm -hmm. you know, she had converted me. And so I felt all the people that I talked to, you know, I felt her the weight of her testimony behind me as I um, mm -hmm. searched my mission. That's beautiful. So um, she's a great influence in my life. And when I came home from my mission, I went, I had graduated from college and then went on my mission and um, to um, Canada, Montreal, Canada, French speaking. And then I went to BYU and started some graduate work there. I met my husband, um, who's also a return missionary and married in the temple. He proposed to me in front of the Provo Temple. Oh, so <laughs> sweet. <laughs> really Mormon story. You're the only ones ever, by the way. I the know. only ones who have gotten engaged <laughs> like that. So many. <laughs> right. Um, and we, mar we got married in Salt Lake. His mission president was M. Russell Ballard. So M. Russell mm. Ballard performed our ceremony, our sealing ceremony in the Salt Lake Temple. And then we had eight children. Um, and like I said, 20 years now, it's amazing. Wow. Um, so I got into Mormon history. Um, I really, 
I started out being very interested in Mormon theology. Um, and I had a little group, an Isaiah group study group <laughs> mm -hmm. of a bunch of my friends get together um, and studied Isaiah. And I actually have two books that I've written on Isaiah, which are really? unpublished. They're not really finished. Um, one day I may finish them, but um, sort of got stared into the field of Mormon history. Mm. And I feel so comfortable and I feel um, I love um, Mormon history. Theology um, is maybe a little bit uncomfortable for me now because now that I'm, I've reached the age I have, I find that, you know, what I what I wrote back when I was 30 is not the same as what I'm thinking when I'm 64, right. you know, <laughs> so your theology kind of changes. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to write about because then, you know, you, and also when you write about Mormon history, it does the same thing, actually. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, but theology is different because it's so personal, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's easy to say, oh, we found some more documents and now I've changed my mind about how the history is. But when you mm. when you change your mind on theology, it's more, um, it, it really, I don't know, um, it's more of a change. It requires more of a shift of it because theology is hopefully guiding our entire paradigm, right? We're building our life around it. So yeah, it, it does require more effort when your theology changes for sure. Yeah, so and pain, I mean, I, pain. Yes, pain, right. <laughs> yes. And I still grapple with theology, but it's sort of more personal for me um, than now, my writing now is, um, is um, more dealing with Mormon studies, Mormon history, um, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. that's kind mm -hmm. of my background. Um, that's beautiful. Well, and I, so in other conversations that I've had with you and that I've heard from you, you really have kind of grav gravitated to this field of esotericism. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, so it fascinates me, um, Joseph Smith involvement in sort of esoteric, um, activities, so mm -hmm. we talk about his treasure seeking or, you know, certain things that he did that were in Freemasonry that were very esoteric. And I wondered about that. And I also am um, having that background with studying Isaiah so closely. I love symbolism mm -hmm. and um, that kind of thing. So um, so I, I've really been interested in um, the hidden. So esoteric means just hidden, right? So the hidden aspects as you read the scriptures, what is hidden in the scriptures that we're mm -hmm. not picking up? And and that's what I just love. And so I also find things that are hidden in Joseph Smith's story that we can bring out and that we can discover. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, and it seems like it's led you to some different places. As you said in your bio, you made a deck of Mormon themed tarot cards, which I think is so like crazy cool. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of tarot, but, um, but I had some traumatic experiences when I was, uh -oh. when I was young, but it, uh -oh. yeah, I, I didn't know any better and it was a little bit scary. Um, but like, that's a very kind of new age sort of thing that people, that people are into. So how is it that your esotericism interest has led you into different fields of study than maybe what would be considered like considered in the good, okay, like Mormon box yeah. of things? Yeah, that's not, it's out of the box. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I sort of have to talk about tarot just for a second. Yes, um, please do. Because um, my interest in tarot is maybe not what you would immediately think mm -hmm. um, when you discover that I'm into tarot. Mm -hmm. And um, it's happened. My first husband is deceased and I married a second time. My second husband was very into, um, he was a Freemason and mm -hmm. into tarot cards. Um, but interestingly, um, the way he approached tarot cards was that it um, it brings you in touch with your subconscious, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, when he would read someone's tarot, and I don't really, I don't really read people's tarot um, so much. I I have done it, um, but I don't feel like I'm very good at it, um, mm -hmm. like Joe was, um, because what he did was he tried to you know tell you what the symbol meant on the card. And then have you draw out from you mm. how you thought that related to your life. Mm. And um, so the symbol is very powerful. You can look at it and then you can, you draw out of your subconscious or even from, you know, spiritual sources, 
what it is that you should do being um kind of spurred on by the the symbol in mm -hmm. there right mm -hmm. so um so the mormon tarot is very interesting because we have so many symbols in mormonism that bring to our minds like lots of things mm -hmm. you know like even looking at a picture of brigham young's face say mm -hmm. you know can can cause all kinds of thoughts to come to mind right so mm -hmm. we might think of him as being our Mormon Moses that led the saints across the plains. And you know what I'm saying? It just mm -hmm. all those things come into your mind when you look at, just look at his face. Right. So, um, so I think my Mormon tarot does that um, mm. and helps people sort of get in touch with their feelings about Mormonism, mm -hmm. which can oh, be yeah. very complicated sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Those aren't for sale anymore though, right? Well, I'm hoping that I can do a second edition. The first edition is, is all sold out. Okay. Yeah, okay. So. Well, well, let us know, let us know. When I that never comes really out. advertise them. If people they learn about them and get very excited. Mm -hmm. they want them, so, <laughs> so um, I think I will do a second edition. They're really fun. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I think that's fascinating. So the, other, the other reason I, I get curious because I love art too. Mm. And um, if you look at, and I have a collection of, I don't know, maybe a hundred, maybe 150 um, tarot decks. Mm. And the reason I collect them is just because I love the art, the yeah. way that people um, interpret these symbols and, and um the way I did it was Mormonism. And mm -hmm. then other people have, I don't know, tarot cats or. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, there's a um, theme for everyone i'm sure yeah yeah so, i don't know awesome. there's lord of the rings tarot mm -hmm. but um but a lot of them are very artistic and i love seeing this expression um yeah art so um that's a big part of my um enjoyment of tarot yeah that's beautiful thank you for sharing that thank you for sharing that so obviously i mean we're talking we're talking all over the board here we're talking mormon tarot we're talking about Joseph Smith and free, Freemasonry, polygamy, um, obviously a slew of church history topics. You and I and a, a friend of ours talked for over an hour yesterday, kind of hitting a lot of different things, I think, in a short amount of time. Lots about the temple. So uh, how is it that you have approached learning in general? Um, is it just that you're kind of going where you feel drawn to, what you're interested in? Have you felt guided to these different things? And what, and let's have, let's start talking a little bit more about discernment too. Like, how is it that you have started to, as you've been diving into these places, some of which are very much off the beaten track, right? Like there's not, there's not a general conference talk about how to appropriately approach tarot, <laughs> right? So how is it that you have built a foundation wherein you can continue learning from all these different places and have like kind of an internal compass helping you to discern what is true and what is not. So I really like the word you used guided um, because I do feel um, I, I have um, felt very guided in different ways um, throughout my life. Um, and uh, I raised uh, my first daughter. <laughs> I raised a lot of awesome children, but my first daughter is very spiritual um, and and will tell me when I will call her and lament, um, you know, what happened. Oh, I lost my job. What should I do? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, you know, well, this is, what do you think this means? And you're, you know, spiritually, what is it, you know, what is it pointing you toward? Why do you think this happened? And, you know, kind of puts my mind back into the, onto the spiritual track mm. of, you know, that things happen for a reason. And, you know, that we don't always know what the reason is right away. But if we're open to that uh, feeling of, you know, you're being guided in certain mm -hmm. directions, you can sometimes see that open up mm -hmm. in front of you. Um, whereas if you're just so worried about, you know, how you're going to manage things without opening yourself up to the idea of that it's a guidance in your life, then it could be, it can be um, um, so much worse of an experience. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That's yeah. a really big point. I think I, I think I skip right past that a lot of times when, when talking about this subject or thinking about this subject, because I, 
I I feel an automatic kinship with your daughter. I think I've I've always kind of been that person too. That was that was very spiritually guided. I'm sure my mother would say that she sometimes was like what you were just saying that that she would approach me with something and I would be like, well, what about God? What about what about the spiritual realm that's around us? You know, and how do you think that that's playing in? Okay. Um, but that's really huge to try and develop that perspective. If that's not something that you naturally gravitate towards, stepping outside of our 3D physical experience, this reality that we have in our bodies to try and contemplate the fact that there is so much more than what we see. How is it that you've kind of incorporated that more broad belief and and view of things over time? So starting back with my Isaiah group, I, I that it had so much um it had so much impact in my life, this Isaiah group. Um and maybe I'll just kind of go into a little bit of detail of um how we started it. Mm -hmm. There were I think maybe 10 women in this Isaiah group. And so they didn't all come every week. So maybe we'd have like six or eight people at a time. So nice little small group um that's studying Isaiah. And the very first day that we started the group we went around and everybody um talked about why they were there you know mm -hmm. and so like um several of us were there because we want to get deeper into the scriptures and we already had a good um um kind of a handle on Isaiah we'd read through it many times and we wanted to just get deeper in mm -hmm. um some had one lady had been a member all her life but had never read any of the scriptures mm -hmm. so she mm -hmm. wanted to um make sure that she uh, read the scriptures. And this was a way to motivate her to read the scriptures. Um, one was a new convert. She wanted to, you know, get into the Mormon um, aspect of how do Mormons interpret Isaiah. Mm. Um, and so we had like a huge variety of, uh, oh, and one of them said, I don't really care about Isaiah. I just like you guys. And I was Aww. Just <laughs> right. <laughs> I would join a study so, group for that yeah, reason. So we had um we had this huge variety of people and it was so interesting because you would think and I maybe thought even at the beginning that you know those of us who had the scriptural background would kind of lead the group but it didn't turn out that way at all because yeah. um we found that each person had their own um you know spiritual gift to add to the um to the community of us studying um, and someone who knew nothing about Isaiah could come up with this great insight and we would all go, oh, you know, <laughs> this big collective, oh, mm. so many times we did that. Um, and so it was really, it was fascinating to me. So I, um, at that point, I realized uh, that the spirit is guiding everybody, but in different ways, like, um, projected towards your own um, personality, you know, mm. kind of, um, I think the Lord works in spiritual ways with each person according to how they're going to be able to hear it, you know? Mm. Mm. And so sort of approach the scriptures that way as well. Um, this might be kind of a little bit different than many people um, approach the scriptures, but um, I see the scriptures, they do say that they're inspired of God and that they're they're God breathed, I guess, inspired that word in the, in the New Testament, God breathed. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about that's what the scriptures are. But then also we have um, in our Doctrine and Covenants how God speaks to each person after the manner of their own language mm -hmm. and how they can, they can hear it in their heart. So kind of the way I look at the scriptures are um, that they are certain like man or humanity um, trying to make sense of a world that just doesn't make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, they are struggling with that and they're writing it down. And so we can take the scriptures as a guide. Um, mm -hmm. It helps certain people make um, meaning out of life, but also um, I think that we are called to do the same thing ourselves is make mm -hmm. um, our own peace with it. and. Um, try to understand the world and the unseen world um, for ourselves mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just um, look at somebody else's idea of it um, and take it for granted. But that's just kind of a guide for us to see how it's done. And then we mm -hmm. do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because in some ways it feels like the, the, 
I don't want to say I, I I don't want to say this is like a hard and fast rule, but just observing from what you just said, it seems like God is equally, if perhaps not more interested in our process for coming to truth than that we get to the right answer all at the same time, right? Um, and that's very different, I think, than the way that we di- that we typically talk about things. It it seems to be that if we see a discrepancy in how people interpret something or how people live something, we automatically conclude, well, someone is right and someone is wrong. Yeah. And more often than not, it's I'm right and you're wrong. (laughs) Right. And like, you are wrong because you didn't, you're wrong because you're not doing it the way that I want to do it. Right. But, But what have you learned about that? Like, do you think that that's consistent with the nature of God based on your experiences? Yes, because I mean, I think that we, none of us can, none of us has gotten there where we know the nature of God until we actually, you know, see him for ourselves, like Joseph Smith did. Yeah. The lectures on faith and talks about, um, you know, that that's the pinnacle of what we need to do is find out a correct idea of mm. God and what he's like. The only reason, the only way we can have a correct idea is by seeing him. So mm-hmm. since I personally haven't seen him, um, I, I, you know, it's my struggle to try to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that that's okay. Yes. I think that's that's totally okay. okay. And I think we have guides, like we have our iron rods, we have our guides that are pointing us in the right direction, but the journey is different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. So if the goal then to understand the character of God is to come to know God personally, right. To see God, to see God and to be like God, right. Because Moroni says, you will see me as I am because you will be, you will be like me. We will be like him. And that's how we see, but that's a transformative process, what we're talking about there. So that's all the messy parts of like trying to figure out how to, how to get there. What, what has been your experience in trying to understand the nature of God, knowing that we won't understand God until we get to that point, but that we have to be moving. We have to be working and trying. We have to be wrestling with these things to come to a greater understanding in order to exercise that faith, right? Because that's what the lectures on faith say, is that you cannot exercise faith unto salvation or in this case, unto seeing the face of God, unless you have a correct understanding of God. So what has that journey looked like for you to try and figure that out? Yeah, it's so difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Just um, explaining my own personal journey. But Mm -hmm. like, when I write about Mormon history, um, and uh, Mormon history so fascinates me, because it is just the story of all these imperfect people like colliding against Mm -hmm. each other and trying Mm -hmm. to figure it out. Um, and colliding against their world there are people Mm -hmm. all around them who didn't understand and so when I write about Mormon history a lot of times um, I need to separate myself I need to separate Mm -hmm. my um, my theology or my ideas of what you know Joseph Smith should have been like you know Mm -hmm. from what I actually see him doing or what I see him saying or you know um um just the hist of the, the whole history of um of mormonism and so when i was writing my book on freemasonry i sort of had an open mind and it didn't um butt up against my personal faith at all to write mm. about joseph smith and i just wanted to see what was happening and try to set it out the best i could according to any of the documentation that we could find and that we mm. have and the evidence um but in the end it gave me a beautiful picture. You know, yeah. it was so surprising at how it really did give me a beautiful picture. And I think that in the end, my book is over 500 pages um, and not a lot of people have read it all the way through. <laughs> but I think those who have um, are saying that you really can approach it from a very faithful perspective or you can approach it the other way. A lot of mm. people can take Joseph Smith's Freemasonry and make something of it that, you know, that doesn't look so kindly towards the church but then I think it's the opposite too and I personally I feel just this great love for Joseph Smith and the things that he did and Mm -hmm. even um I know many might disagree with me but Brigham Young as well Mm -hmm. I have a great admiration for Brigham Young you heard me just talk about him as our as our Mormon Moses um and 
there's this quote that Brigham Young says, um, I feel like shouting hallelujah all the time when I think I ever knew the prophet Joseph Smith. And I think he loved Joseph Smith. Mm. And there was a tender spot in Brigham Young's heart um, for Joseph Smith and all he did. And I think that um, in his motivation, no matter, even though he was a, you know, a, just a, a man, a human, like many of us are, um, he still was trying very um, diligently, I think, in my head, um, to do what he felt Joseph would have done. That's, mm -hmm. that's my opinion of, of Brigham. Thank but I, I like to look at people in general that way, that mm -hmm. everyone is trying the best they can. <laughs> so give them a little grace, you know, right. I can come down hard, as you saw last week. Mm -hmm. And someone I don't think is doing the right thing. Right. <laughs> but in the end, I feel like they have good motivations and they, they're not, most people are not doing things because they think it's bad or evil. They're just mm. doing the best they can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Um, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think you brought up something that is so critical to this whole process of seeking for truth. Um, and I'd really like to uh, like look at it again and maybe drill down a little bit deeper. But you were what you were talking about there about being able to disconnect your theology, I would say kind of like the foundation of your faith from the issue, right? From the thing that you're looking at, from the thing that you're studying. This is something that I think has gotten so many people into trouble unnecessarily, right? Um, and and you see this with hot topic items like Freemasonry polygamy, um, Brigham Young, some of those other things that are really, um, they're very emotional topics right now. They're, they're very much hot, high on people's minds. And I think there's reasons for that. I actually think that's a good thing. I think there's a beautiful invitation in what the Lord is doing right now with asking us to wrestle with these issues and come to an understanding and come to, a, and come to a personal belief. Right. Um, I think that as we talked about, God is probably less interested that we all come to the same conclusion and is more interested in an individual being willing to engage with God and fight it out and come to a conclusion. And right? maybe even how are you all getting along? <laughs> right. And how, and are you still being Christ-like in the process? Right. Like, are you looking at people like your enemy? Or are you looking at them through eyes of charity? Are you looking at them? Are you willing to learn from them? I actually love um, in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, he talks about how there was a man who came into town who, he, you know, he invited him in, had dinner with him, sat him down. And the guy is talking doctrine and he's, he's saying all these things. He's actually saying a lot of things that are true. And then he starts talking about resurrection and Joseph's like, mm, you don't have a correct understanding of this. And so he continues with him for a couple more days and, and like, not only is Joseph having these conversations with him, but he gives him the stand, like with the people, go ahead and preach what it is that you want to be preaching right now. Also, at the same time, it came out that this man might be a murderer who had been kind of infamous back in the East and that he was showing up now. Anyway, so Joseph literally has this man teaching the people um, for days, for days on end. And then he gets to the point that's like, you know, this thing that you said about re resurrection is, incor is incorrect. You have a false spirit with you. I've learned basically what I need to learn. And, and now it's time for you to go. And I just think that that example is so mind blowing for us today to even think about applying because we would never do it. We would never approach someone that way. If we had an inkling that this was a bad person who did bad things, we would automatically say, you have nothing to teach me. And we do it all the time. We do it all the time. Some of my closest friends and people that I honestly believe have, have seen the face of God and have a correct understanding of that are excommunicated members of the church, people that we would never listen to under other circumstances. And so what I want to talk about here is how can we, like, how do we get there? Can we get there? Like Joseph was an amazing man. He was not a perfect man though. And I would like to think that any of us could aspire to be that brave and bold and meek and willing to learn from anywhere. What do you yeah. think about that? Yes. And, and I think Joseph was amazingly, a lot of people um, describe him as a sponge. 
you know, mm -hmm. he took everything, you know, he took from Freemasonry, he took from Christianity, he took from all different places, wherever he could find something that he felt was valuable, mm -hmm. he felt very comfortable bringing it into his theology. And so um, he, he was a great example of that, like you mm -hmm. just described. Um, and also there's like an Eastern philosophy of um, where the people that come into your life are your teachers, right? Mm -hmm. No matter whether they're like, if you have a horrible, abusive, you know, father or whatever, but he's your teacher in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm not saying that quite right, but <laughs> it's, it sounds, that, it sounds right. <laughs> let's just say that, um, let's just say that even in people come into our lives that um, maybe don't seem like, you know, this righteous teacher or anything, they, um, they are teaching us something, right? Mm -hmm. Whether mm -hmm. it's, I'm never going to be like that mm -hmm. with my own children. What not to do. Or, yeah. Right, right. Um, so some way they're your teacher. Um, and that's kind of um, an interesting way to look at, at mm -hmm. things. Um, mm -hmm. So um, with, let's kind of get into like Michelle, mm -hmm. um, because I th think that that was interesting that you had her on and it's sort of kind of maybe this, a little bit of similar path um, of what I've taken with my relationship with Michelle, because I, what I've seen in the past, um, she came to my attention a little over a year ago, maybe almost two years ago, with that she was doing these podcasts on, you know, 132 problems about polygamy. And um, when I first um, saw that she was doing this, I really discounted her. Like, she doesn't know much about anything, and who is she to say anything about mm -hmm. anything? And and I think the Mormon, like, scholarly world um, feels the same, that she's not really, um, she doesn't have the background to talk about this um but as i have watched her over this little period of time she's taken a very uh, specific interest that she has in a very specific topic and she has gone very deep into it and studied it very sincerely and i think she's really totally getting there um and so at this point i feel like that she has many many things to teach the scholarly community that a different way of interpreting the evidence that we have interpreted a certain way um, mm -hmm. and is now outdated, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to come to my community and say, these arguments are valid. We need to address those things that she is saying. There's a little bit of pushback on that because mm -hmm. they don't want to address, they feel like that the, that the conversation has already been had and we've already talked about these things, which would you know, some of them we have, but mm -hmm. um, I really would like for us to get back involved in taking her seriously. And mm -hmm. there are several other people that um, that believe as she does that have done some great research. Um, mm -hmm. So when we think of people as, um, we don't discount them as like in my Isaiah group, right? We don't discount the person that's never read Isaiah before or we don't discount the person that's just in there for friendship. You know, we can learn mm. so much from those people. And now Michelle, I think, has become probably, I would say, the authority on this particular subject of whether Joseph Smith, whether or not Joseph Smith practiced polygamy because she has so deeply looked into it. Mm -hmm. So I want to take her seriously. I want to learn what she has to give me. And then... Um, I sort of feel like, and this is not, I've always said that I don't want to get into women's issues or polygamy in my history. <laughs> I don't want to do that. It's a mess. But I'm like, okay, <laughs> I've been guided there. Um, uh, so I feel like if no one else wants to take this on, there's some of the things that I need to take on. Um, and Michelle's willing to listen to me also. Mm. And so that's by me being open enough to, um, listen to her and to have conversations with her, um, then, you know, she gives me the same um, grace that she will mm -hmm. listen to things that I have to say. And sometimes it gets a little bit, um, you know, heated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but it's great for both of us um, to mm -hmm. see these different, these different sides. And that's what history is all about because we cannot know the past. We cannot know what Joseph Smith was thinking, you know, unless we talk to him. 
we can't know God unless we see him, right. you know, so what we have to do is just take the evidence and interpret it the best we can and, and hopefully have the spirit with us that will guide us just um, do an honest job of looking at it and, mm -hmm. um, and use the techniques that are um, um, time worn techniques that, you know, help us to analyze it. I think it's really important to have that conversation. So absolutely. Yeah. Hundred percent. I think it's important. I think it's important. It needs to be said, and it lines up with a lot of the things that I've been seeing. Um, you know, kind of going back to as we've been studying the Book of Mormon, we were reading in Second Nephi twenty-eight, and it talks about you know, woe unto those who say we have enough. And I've really been feeling this energy lately of people who are saying we have enough. And they might not be saying about the Bible, right? That was kind of the context of that given. But the Bible is representative of the word and truth of God. It's representative of the spirit. It's representative of things as they really are. Um, and as you were saying, until we know God, we're just all in a practice round of trying to get to know God. And we can't, we can't just pick an arbitrary point and say, well, I'm done now. Like I've I, done my due diligence. I've come to a conclusion. This is where I am. And this is where I'm going to stay. I think that that is in a lot of ways, like the definition of damnation is for us to do that. Um, and I really appreciate you having the humility and the open-mindedness to be able to say, you know, we had an understanding. There are so many books that are written. There's so many great people who have done incredible work. Um, and then being willing to say, but now our work, there has been more, there has been more given and we're going to look at that. We're not going to be afraid to look at it because it might change what we have said or not, you know, either way, whether Michelle is right or not, somebody has to deal with it. Somebody has yeah. to show, right? So they're looking at it different ways than have been looked at before. I mean, yes. Um, Joseph Smith, the third in the community of Christ looked at, um, Joseph never, um, practiced polygamy and Pamela Price and her husband um, mm -hmm. wrote those wonderful books, Joseph Fought Polygamy, that um, brought a lot of evidence. But um, but the last two years, the group that's been doing it the last two years have looked at the issue in ways that I don't think have been looked at before with um, new evidence that hasn't really been generally available before. Like we have the Joseph Smith papers, we have mm -hmm. so many um, journals and things that are we can sit in our kitchen like I'm doing today and, <laughs> and just go on our computer and and find you know and read through people's journals um and it's so this is opens up a, a huge world to us mm. um so we have to I think we have to use not one person can do it all <gasps> that's the mm -hmm. thing you know that's why I want my scholarly community to also get involved in this so maybe I can look at you know William Clinton's journal <laughs> And even Michelle, you know, she's looking at all these things that can't do it all. So whatever we can bring to the table and show her, well, mm -hmm. you know, you haven't looked at this aspect of it. And um, we all need to be together and we all need to cooperate on this and have patience yeah. with each other, too. Um, yeah. But really, an open mind. Oh, my gosh. I really think an open mind is so critical on this. Um, because if we think we know exactly what God thinks or exactly what Joseph was like, then that's when we don't. Because um, the other day I did a podcast with Michelle um, and it was on Freemasonry. This has been the subject of my research for like, I'm going to say now, I keep saying 10 years, but now it's actually been closer to 15 years mm. that I've been studying this. And sometimes daily, sometimes for, you know, 10 hours a day. So hours and hours and hours of research mm. on Freemasonry with documents that most people have never seen. Um, so I know this subject very, very well. And so what I was saying to her audience, uh, a lot of them were saying, were, um, talking about the Joseph Smith fought polygamy. And also he was never a Freemason. Um, and so I was saying, well, look, why don't you divide those two things? Because I think you have a really good case right now for, um, Joseph didn't practice polygamy. So you have some very good points, but but you can't really say that Joseph wasn't a Freemason because we know that for sure. Mm -hmm. We have the documentation, so we are sure, sure, sure that he was a Freemason. And um, so I went on her podcast to show what the documents were and talk about that. 
And um, I think that people can probably take Freemasonry and um, interpret it many different ways. And I wasn't asking them to say Freemasonry is good, Freemasonry is bad. All I wanted to do was prove Joseph Smith joined the Masonic Lodge mm -hmm. in 1842. Please accept that because we have documentation. And so many people, one, they wouldn't even look at the podcast, but then they wanted to write on and on and on why Joseph would never have done that. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's not being open minded. That's not being willing to look at, okay, here I have this document. I have this document. I have this document. I have four different documents. What do you think about them? Because mm -hmm. I would be open to if they would just look at those and say, well, here's why the documentation is suspect or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but to not even open up your mind and to make that decision without even um, considering the um, the evidence, you, you don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that to Michelle's evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it goes on both sides. Um, we have to have an open mind. And I think the Lord might show us things if we have that open mind that we never imagined that could ever, that could ever happen. Yeah. People have asked me because they, they've made the comment they say, you know, back in your earlier podcast, you said this such and such thing. And then in a recent podcast, you said this thing that was almost exactly the opposite. And I always say, yes, I reserve the right to change my mind. I am in a process of learning and growing and I get it wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. And I might change my mind to something else that's wrong. So I, you know, I'm in a process of evolution, the same as we all are. Um, but being willing to accept that, to know that that's part of our you know, going back to the beginning of our discussion about recognizing that there is a spiritual reality and that we are spiritual beings. Um, that is perhaps one of the biggest reasons I think that we can find in common for why we all came here was to learn, was to learn these specific things. And so if you're wrong, great, be wrong and keep looking for what's right. Um, I think kind of a commonality that I see between you and me and Michelle, aside from our, from our opinions on these topics is that we just want what is the truth. And we have very little stake in terms of, um, uh, you know, wanting the truth to support what we think or wanting the truth to make us feel really good and fuzzy and that everything is right we really just want to know what's true. And that's something that I said on that episode with Michelle. Um, you know, as I've been wrestling with the polygamy issue, which I reserve the right to be wrong about. And I think I have a pretty nuanced view of that actually, that's quite different than maybe what a lot of people would think. Um, I, I am more interested in learning what's true than the answer of whether or not Joseph was polygamous. Um, and I, and I told God that I said, God, I just want to know what's true. Like if polygamy is the thing, great. If it's not also great, I just want to know. Right. And so there's this element where we have to get rid of our ego. We have to get rid of our pride. We have to get rid of wanting to be right or to be comfortable or to be satisfied in some ways. Instead, just focus on, I just want to know what, what is real? What is God? What is truth? What is truth? That's what I was going to say. What is truth? And, mm -hmm. um, can we in this mortal state come to even come to, mm. to knowledge of tr truth that might be difficult to do and what if think about this for a minute what if the whole point of it is not to ever have found out the truth in this mortal life but what if god's going to look at us and say well how did you do it you know mm -hmm. how did you treat other people along the way you know what you know what was your method and how did you grow through that mm. so um, mm -hmm. I think that's the more important thing to be thinking as, as we study these issues yeah. um, to that, maybe none of us will be able to come to an exact knowledge of what happened in 1842. You know, <laughs> we just will never know that. Probably um, not. Yeah. Right. But we can maybe um, gain a greater understanding. Like uh, I was saying through my Freemasonry book, I, I just gained an appreciation of Joseph Smith um in so many ways and um i feel like that i was able to work with co-authors when i wrote the book in ways that come sometimes we butt up against each other and sometimes we you know had these wonderful experiences together but just um um the cooperation mm -hmm. learning to cooperate with someone is so important 
Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, there are two great commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Love God and love others as yourself. And are we applying those? Right. Um, I think there's a lot of people who could make the case that the work that Michelle is doing and the work that you are doing um, in relation to Joseph Smith's free, Freemasonry is harmful um, mm -hmm. because there are people who discover Michelle's work or your work um, who think Joseph wasn't a polygamist, Joseph was a polygamist, Joseph wasn't a Freemason, Joseph was a Freemason, and mm -hmm. use that as grounds to leave the church. Mm -hmm. and to abandon some of the foundational principles that they were raised in. And a lot of the times we, when we see that in our friends and family, um, kind of the response, the way that it feels is my family member is going to be damned. They're losing their salvation because they've left this organization. What would you say to someone who maybe would level that kind of claim? Well, I mean, first that it's never over till it's over. <laughs> so, um, so when somebody leaves the church on their journey, it may be um, something that is, um, you know, taking them a certain way that they need to go at that time mm -hmm. and um, teaching them things they need to be taught. We can't, we can't know that for sure. So I wouldn't be horrified that um, somebody is, has left the church. I have a, um, all of my children, seven of my children, seven of my eight children. Well, first of all, I have seven girls and one boy <laughs> <laughs> and, um, seven of them, including the boy have gone on missions and married in the temple. Um, six of them married in the temple. And, um, one of my daughters is gay. She's lesbian and she married a woman and, um, she no longer goes to church. Um, and so doesn't have the exact same um, Latter-day Saint status as the other ones do. Um, but I love her journey and I love seeing where she's going. And I love what she's, she teaches the rest of us and our family, you know, um, and she's such a beautiful person and so is her wife. And so I, I don't have um, a, a feeling of um, fear towards her eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that we need to kind of concentrate on our own self. Mm. Like, I'm more scared about myself mm -hmm. <laughs> than, than I am about her. So, so that's one thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. but also just um, gently when, when these um, subjects come up, you have to deal with them gently, let them just rest on you. Don't, don't let them, you know, bother you so much, mm. you know, because there are so many things in my life now that I've gotten to be an older woman. There's so many things in my life that um, distressed me so much that I wish I had just um, kind of let them lightly settle on me for a few years until I was able to kind of see a broader picture. Mm. Um, and so I think many of these issues are the same thing is we worry about them so much where, you know, later on, we might be able to see, oh, this is how those things connect. This is how this mm. works. And this is why Joseph was being involved in Freemasonry. Or this is, you know, this is, um, I'm not so worried about seer stones anymore, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that. But just let those things just rest lightly. And, um, and what Michelle is doing is not a bad thing. You know, it's, it's very just look at it as interesting. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting. You know, <laughs> what is of interest to this, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, it does. Well, and I think that, uh, you know, I appreciate sometimes it's really hard not to shoot the messenger for the message, you know? Um, and as I said, I don't agree with everything Michelle says. I think she gets things right. I think she gets things wrong. Um, I think I get things right and I get things wrong. And so yeah. I tell my audience all the time, please do not take anything that I say for doctrine. Please go to God and let God be the one to teach you. But if we're going to reject someone, if we're going to re reject someone because of the message, because they feel like the message has had these damaging effects, um, that might be true. That might be true. And God will be the one. I think yeah. to kind of yeah. um and also that. the other thing too is that this stuff is now in our information world this stuff is out there and people are going to encounter it you cannot mm. shield people from these things 
And Michelle is one of the best people to get that from because she does truly love the Lord and she wants to do, you know, she wants to live her life in accord with um, gospel principles. Mm -hmm. And so she's trying to integrate these, these things into her life in a very faithful way. Mm -hmm. So um, she's not a worse person to hear that from. <laughs> Yeah. It's a balance that we all kind of have to make, right? We were talking about also earlier about how um, learning and growing theologically, it's hard. It's hard because um, it is kind of the the center, the, the north on the compass that we are all trying to set our lives to. Um, and when you realize that maybe some of the things that I was taught growing up are not true, or maybe they are, but it's not what I thought it was, or maybe I learned something that was completely false, like it's really hard to align yourself to God after that point, but that's what you have to do is align yourself to God. And, um, there will be things that you were previously aligned to that you might now, you might now not be as aligned to. Uh, and that's really hard. That's, that's a scary thing for a lot of people to do. But again, God is the thing that we have to align ourselves. That's what we're supposed to build our, our, our foundation on. Right. In that, in, um, it's a little chiasm that I found in second Nephi 28, where it says, well, unto you who say you have enough, you tremble lest you should fall when you are presented with new truth. But if you were built on a rock, you would not tremble. You would receive it with gladness, but you're built on a soundy foundation. And so you tremble woe unto those who say you have enough. And so it really is this idea is that if there is something the high that, point is being built on the rock, exactly. Yeah, very good built on the rock and the rock is Jesus Christ. The mm -hmm. rock is Jesus Christ alone. Don't add other things to the rock. <laughs> the rock is Jesus Christ. And so if there's something that's coming up for you or someone that you love, that is controversial, that, um, that makes your skin itch a little bit, you're uncomfortable with it. You're triggered by it. Uh, I really believe that's an invitation to ask yourself, am I built on the rock? And, and if not, what do I believe that I need to reevaluate in order to be built on the rock. That's great. And sort of going along with that is um, when I was teaching seminary, I loved teaching the Old Testament. And I always tell my students that when you come across these strange little stories in the Old Testament, they're very weird little stories. Mm -hmm. The weirder it is, the more you can think, ah, this is something the Lord wants me to look yes, at. There's a mystery. It's so weird. There's something <laughs> to this little story that I'm not understanding yet. So mm -hmm. those are the stories we want to look at. We want to um, see what it is. Why are they there? You know, what yeah. can they teach me? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, don't write it off. Don't write Joseph off because he was a Mason. Go find out why. Like, how is it that Joseph was so unafraid? Mm -hmm. He was so yeah. unafraid to find, to, to, to take from all these different traditions. I mean, if you look at the man, <laughs> he was all over the place in yeah. what he was doing. And he wanted that for us too. He said, I want my people to be able to believe what they believe because mm -hmm. I want the right to believe as I believe. That was a horrible, you know, nah, no. <laughs> modification of, of the real quote. I'm not, I'm not very good at the, at the word for word quoting, but Joseph was not dogmatic and we have become in our tradition quite dogmatic. And so yeah, there's something true. to do there. I think there's some unlearning that we could do in that way. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, I have to know what the Lord is drawing you to when you say women's issues, you're feeling like that's what you need to be diving into. No. Well, I mean, that's what I've always said. I, I don't want to be known as a Mormon historian and a woman. I do not want to be known for women's <laughs> issues. I want to, you know, like, it's I so to, cliche, right? I know. It's I felt like, the same way about be... going to BYU. I was um, like, oh, I'm such a good Mormon girl. I don't want to go to BYU because it'll just solidify. And the Lord was like, you're going to BYU. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so the thing, some of the things I've sort of um, gotten into that um, were just kind of led into were um, I wrote an article on the Novi Relief Society, mm -hmm. and um, I that's out there on my um, academia page, so anyone could read that. Um, I actually put when once my work is published, I usually put it up online so that people can find it and read it um, and quote from it if they want to. <laughs> um, so I did. So I have studied quite a bit about the early Relief Society, 
mm-hmm. um, even though I did not want to do that. But, um, <laughs> but it's it's actually very fascinating, and it does um, mesh with Freemasonry and that mm. kind of thing too. Um, the book that I'm writing right now, um, I'm actually writing two books. Or, well, two books of mine are coming out in the next couple of months. And one of them is um, a book I'm editing that has essays by many different authors, and it's called Secret Covenants, A New Insights on Mormon Polygamy, which right? I didn't want to get involved in that, but, <laughs> um, but I was asked to do this, and um, I have learned so much from that because um, some of the authors that have written these essays for this book, I think, have opened up my mind in many ways to... Um, what was happening um, in many of the aspects of Mormon polygamy. Hmm. Um, and then the other one is on William Marks, um, who was an early leader of the church. I'm doing a biography with John Dinger on William Marks. But then, you know, you're always coming across like, okay, what about his wife? And what about his daughter? And all these women just pop up. And you're mm-hmm. like... <laughs> so I don't know. It's, women are a big part of Mormon history. We can't deny it. And their stories haven't been told. And the thing is about, um, about me being a woman historian, I feel like I can tell their stories a lot of times in a way that men can't see. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich wrote a book on a midwife's tale. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how women have um, women. They're they're just their daily, like her, her daily journal of this Mm. one midwife was just so like bland almost. And you Mm. look at, you know, you might look at it and just discount it and say, that's not really history because she's just saying, oh, I woke up, I Mm. made the dinner, made the breakfast for the kids. And, you know, I gathered the, you know, wool and made this blow. But but the way she presents this is just amazing because Mm. she puts it into the um, historical, milieu that the, the, the lady mm-hmm. lived in and just shows what, what a woman's life was like it's so fascinating mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um yeah so that's the the strength of a woman historian that we can tell mm-hmm. women's stories in a way that is very unique so mm-hmm. I maybe don't have to fight against that so, yeah so much. Let it go. I know well I imagine <clears throat> being in a man's field it probably feels like being a woman is a challenge because you feel like you have to justify yourself to them, you know, a lot of times. And I say this for the record, hopefully like my listeners who have been with me for a while know I was never a feminist. I was never a feminist growing up. And I still wouldn't use that term to describe myself. But as I talked about with my podcast with Michelle, we actually talked quite a bit about women and I've coined the term divine feminist. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of how I feel is that uh, I have a mother in heaven and I want to be in her priestesshood and I want to be trained to be like her. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I see these things more than I ever did before. I just didn't really look for them. I didn't want, I think I didn't want to see him and, and I didn't think it impacted me. Um, and I've since grown to see, uh, to see more, to see how those things are there. They do have lasting impacts and they're a challenge for, for all of us. But I think the way that we go about that, you know, choosing to step into your role as a woman historian who can tell the women's stories is so huge and so divine and such a great ministry. Um, and so very different from, I think a lot of the calls that we hear from people who are trying to advocate for women of like, we need to ordain women or women need to have the priesthood or something like that. Those movements don't really resonate with me at all. Um, because I, because that's the man's, I want the men to have that. I want the men to have that. I want them to grow in that capacity. I think that was meant to be theirs. I feel like women are just waiting to step into our own space. Uh, and I think that that ministry you talked about is a fantastic way for you to do that. So um, yesterday I had a very long conversation with Maxine Hanks, who yeah. also talks about um, women's priestesshood, which mm-hmm. she differentiates from um, priesthood. Mm-hmm. And um, we know that the church is sort of out of order on that point because um, Joseph Smith never intended for women to be powerless in the church or mm-hmm. not to have authority in the church. Um, he really meant for them to, um, and 
so much of Maxine's work is not published yet, but um, mm. shows shows this very clearly. Um, but it was a priesthood and authority that you know was particular to women, um, and I think is hope I hope will you know be brought out more in the coming years um, mm -hmm. as people struggle with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that is one of the other issues that is coming up right now, right? I use that phrase. It sounds very passive, but I actually think it's the exact opposite. I think that God is really holding up a mirror to us um, as individuals, as communities, as the church, as the world right now and saying, look at yourself. You have some disorder here. Do you want to fix it or do you want me to fix it? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and um, if we let him fix it, it's going to be really painful. <laughs> um, and it's good. I mean, it's going to be painful either way, but I like autonomy. I like to choose when the bandaid gets ripped off, um, instead of just having someone out of nowhere come and rip it off. And, you know, I'm, I'm not quite as prepared for it. Um, so I really think that there's a reason why women's issues and divine feminism, priestesshood, why these things are coming to the surface right now. And I think that you're right. I think it's because this is yet to be restored. Um, and I think Joseph really did try to put that, to, to yeah. put the framework there for women to step into that role. Um, there's some discrepancy. Do you want to talk? Should we talk a little bit about this? Can we talk a little bit about yes, the origin of the relief society? Yes, let's do, let's do. Okay, please do. So can you tell us a little bit of the background? Like what, what did Joseph do? And then what happened after that, that kind of left it so that what we have today is not necessarily what Joseph was trying to do. Okay, so man, I'm just not prepared for this, but so I might just ramble on a little bit. But, That's okay, um, please So do. when I was studying how the Relief Society came to be in Nauvoo, it was very interesting to me because the men were very involved at it first. So we had three mm -hmm. men come in and they, you know, the women get together and they, um, they start organizing. And I think it was that the men actually came up with the name um, that they wanted to call the Relief Society, like some benevolent society or something like that that was similar to some of the wording that um women other women um in society had been doing at mm, the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and emma said no um i think it should be you know blah 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 and i think joseph then put her you know kind of in her place and said no you know let's do this and then she just stood up and <laughs> no, you know, and she just it was not having any of it mm. because she and I think Joseph um was very good about recognizing Emma's power mm. and Emma's authority, and he wanted her to um and I think he wanted the Relief Society to be a place where women make their own decisions, you know. And he realized, I think, at that point, that you know, if the men were gonna like get so involved that they were going to name it and not let the women name it themselves, then it wasn't going to work the way mm -hmm. he pictured it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think he did take a step back. And even though he came in and did talk to the women several times, um, that it was a society where they were very involved. And also, I think butt heads a little bit in that society. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that a little bit. And so they were working with how they were going to come together and and form the society. And it was very sad that it did, um, you know, that emphasis was taken off the early society at the martyrdom of Joseph. And But there always was a little core of women that kept it going. Mm -hmm. You know, even though Brigham mm -hmm. said, he didn't want the females huddling together. <laughs> so, but Such they a Brigham did. Young thing they to say. <laughs> they did huddle together and they kept it going, you know, until it gradually, you know, grew. Um, but I don't think that it ever, there's some quote in there that talks about how until the women are fully organized, the church is not fully organized until the women are fully organized. And I don't think we, ne we ever have become fully organized as mm -hmm. he pictured it. And uh, Maxine Hanks says the same thing. And in fact, that thought really kind of comes from Maxine and her work, which is so important on Mormon feminism. Mm -hmm. And she um, she doesn't believe that we should like usurp the men's place you know, necessarily because mm -hmm. the male power is very important. Um, but we have not reached the point 
that we need to be at. And mm -hmm. I think it was very instructive to see our general Relief Society meeting just last week. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of women who wanted to have their say about what was said in that meeting mm -hmm. was fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's just a huge number of women um, made comments about that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a good thing. This mm -hmm. is a good thing because we're getting all these different perspectives come in mm -hmm. and listen to these voices and listen to the voices of our women leaders, but also listen to the other voices that have something to say about it. I think that that's going to be really important in how the Relief Society goes forward in the mm -hmm. coming years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that background. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I actually heard that quote just this last week with the Relief Society devotional, um, talking about how the church is not finished until the women are organized. And it hit me in that moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> we're not done yet. And like, we, we talk about that, right? Like we say it's an ongoing restoration. Um, but I don't think we look at the or the order of the women as one of the things that is yet to be fulfilled. And we really need to, we really need to. I think people get kind of gun shy about this issue for a couple different reasons. As we talked about, it seems that some women um, seem to be politically motivated or just interested in usurping that authority, right, of the priesthood or having the same thing, feeling like that's going to make them equal. And that really turns a lot of people off sometimes. Um, I, I'm not saying in the church necessarily, but I think the movement in general is not always appealing to some people. What's going through my head right now is um, there were um, in years past, um, we've had um, women, Mormon women feminists um, use the term um, equality is not a feeling because many Mormon mm. women um want to say oh well i feel equal in the church mm -hmm, and i'm mm -hmm. fine so you guys should all feel fine it too right. um but equality is not a feeling um because we can see that you know there's not there's not um when there's inequality it's very apparent you know mm -hmm. we can see this and no matter how much we say oh women women can um access the priesthood by being baptized or they mm -hmm. can take the sacrament or they can but the, the but the point is that there's not um an equality of power and authority that exists in the church right now and it's very clear and very obvious and mm -hmm. um and it's almost masked in a way um by when we have really good men in our lives who don't um hold their power over our heads you know, if we have a really good bishop who wants to listen to what the women have to say, um, it's almost masked in a mm -hmm. way that we're not that we're not equal, that mm -hmm. we don't have the power and authority that we should have. Um, we don't have control over our own lesson manuals. We don't have, um, you know, we're not doing things like the early women in Utah, mm -hmm. you know, um, building our own Relief Society buildings and raising silkworms and things like that, you know, <laughs> um, and there are many good things that we can do, but we're not at the point yet where we have reached the, the complete, you know, um, equality. And so when these two things are equal, they're not like, they're not the same, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're, and so I personally am not asking to be the same as men. You know, I don't think I would run very well. Um, I would not, um, I would not be able to enter a man's world very well. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have um, strengths that um, I come out of my feminine um, mystique. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? That aren't yet being utilized mm -hmm. in the church. So mm -hmm. we do have a way to go. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be hard because we can't, we can't see that. I haven't seen the vision quite yet. And I think mm -hmm. many people have not seen the vision quite yet. So yeah. I think out of everyone, the Mormon feminist people are putting down, you know, or excommunicating or something are the ones that actually do have a clearer vision than many mm -hmm. of us. So mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about them. Um, 
you know, even if they're saying oh, we want the priesthood, they still they have a they have a vision of what it could be like. So mm -hmm. um I'm willing to listen to what they're saying. Yeah. And yeah. Why they're saying it. I think part of the problem is is that we misunderstand definitions. Um, exactly like what you were just saying. When we say priesthood, we tend to mean power and authority, when in reality, scripturally, that's never what it refers to. It's always referring to an order, to a body, right? A neighborhood, a sisterhood, a priesthood. It's a gathering of priests. So I have no interest in being there <laughs> um, because I'm not a man and I'm not growing into a priest. I want a priestesshood because I'm a woman and I want to grow into a priestess. Um, and both of those entities have access to the power and authority of God, which is a title for two beings, a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. And so there's a whole broader conversation, like you said, that needs to be had, starting yeah. with that, starting with the fact that right. we have a heavenly mother and that's a doctrine we claim to believe in, um, but it's one that we haven't taught. And yeah. I think there's a we whole bunch of- We don't know what she does. We don't right. know, like when you say you want a priestesshood, what do you envision when you say that? What would that mean? Dave? Oh, Cheryl, what you're opening the can of worms. <laughs> So you do have a clear idea. So, so this has become the topic that the Lord has been putting on my heart, that unexpected thing that you're like, really, is that really, that's what you were, that's where you want me to go with this, um, has been the balance of masculine and feminine and seeing that in God, seeing that in types and shadows of everything, seeing it in scripture. Um, and so that's been the thing that God has really been drawing my mind to is showing me what is a, what is a masculine energy versus a feminine energy? What do those look like? What symbols are there for both of those? Um, how do they interact with each other? How do they integrate with each other? What does it look like when you have a healthy masculine and a healthy feminine in perfect balance with each other? And it looks like a seed of creation. I can tell you that. Like it looks like the center of a galactic sphere. Um, and so it's it's been mind boggling for me and it's been such a beautiful ministry. Um, it is out of the box. It is out of the box and it is informed by a lot of different places. Um, obviously, including scripture, including the teachings of prophets, um, but a lot of personal revelation and a lot of spiritual downloads and looking in other places. There are other religious traditions that I feel like have done a better job at preserving the divine feminine. Um, and I think that for us, frankly, I think that it was a doctrine that Joseph never really had the time opportunity, perhaps even the stewardship to really restore um, because he was a man, right? So he was here to do the man's side of it. And people have made comments about Emma and maybe she was supposed to do it and she just didn't or whatever. And I don't really have an opinion on that because we don't have anything I think that could really point to that one way or the other. I love Emma. I think she did amazing. I think that um, there are very few women who compare to Emma. So I, I don't have any bad words for her. I'll, I know she has a lot of critics. I'm not going to go there at all. Um, but in looking in other traditions, I think that we actually see some uh, fingerprints of our Heavenly Mother. We had a conference back in October, November, beginning of November last year. And we were blessed to have Margaret Barker, Dr. Margaret Barker, come and speak at our conference. And she is the foremost scholar in the world of an ancient tradition of heavenly mother mm -hmm. and that she was in the Israelite temple and what the symbols of her are. And so that was kind of one of the first places that God led me was a lot of her work, um, studying archetypes of women that we have in the scriptures, like studying Mary Magdalene, studying Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the Lord led me to some beautiful apocryphal accounts about her that were really mind exploring for seeing her in a much broader context. And then obviously we look at Eve. Um, those are kind of the top, the main three, but there are more, there are more women in scripture and they teach you things. Like there's a reason that Anna was referred to as a prophetess. That's a real thing. There's a reason that Deborah was referred to as a prophetess and also a, a general, <laughs> like she, she led the people in battle. 
Um, and so you start to pull on those threads. And for me, the Lord has just led me to a million places. I, I feel like, um, kind of a Renaissance student. I don't really get deep into any particular topic, but I cover the board uh, on a lot of these different things. And so in doing that, the Lord has been giving me, I think piece by piece, a broader vision of, of what it's going to look like for women. And it is, um, opposite of what we think, because we think like men, we think like the priesthood, we have this very hierarchical, um, this kind of masculine energy of, of, we just got to don't go and do things. It's very active. It's very bright. The masculine is like the sun, right? It's very life-giving. It's, it's a creator. That's what our heavenly father is. Right. Um, and so God has shown me that the feminine in, in, um, complement to that is like the moon, which is so much more nuanced than the sun. You know, if you think about it, we see the moon in phases, one side of it, and then another side of it is always hidden. And so there's, there's this element of, we come to know our heavenly mother in these phases and these different times and seasons of our lives, right. Of the fact that we are women. I think our bodies are one of the best tutors that we have. Our intuition is the female book of Mormon that we have in our heart to kind of help us unravel these things. But there's part of it that's also just this creative potential that's unending, that dark side of the moon. Who knows what's there, right? The esotericism, the hidden yes. part, the hidden yes. part that we don't yes. see. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that we've come to look at um, power and authority with the, you know, the male side of power and authority and not the mm -hmm. female side of power and authority. What would, right. what would female power look like? Yes. You know, would you, you probably... That? you've experienced that in your work. I think, you know, being in a field that is so male driven, um, you know, the, the masculine energy has a lot to do with thinking analysis, um, mm -hmm. headspace, right? Like it's very much there. Whereas the feminine side is much more intuitive. It's our heart. It's our gut feeling. It's knowing from this place that's beyond logic. Um, and we've shut that and, down. Like, let me go back a little bit to, um, Michelle on this. I'm kind mm. of, um, going a different direction here but um yeah, go ahead. but i think that a lot of the reason why um her her model of um that joseph wasn't a polygamist that this was um something that was started later by brigham young is um seized onto by a lot of women because um they uh, because of their emotions and because their feelings mm. and their um because we have so many feelings that go along with um you know, Mormon polygamy, mm -hmm. women just have, um, have many feelings that, that come up, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that they want to grasp onto and say, well, you know, the, the picture I have of Joseph Smith isn't, um, you know, a polygamist. I get what you mean. It's very emotional. It's a very right. feminine energy that is coming into this, um, into this, um, field here, mm -hmm. you know? And so almost our male historians don't know what to do with this, right? You know, they're just like, you know, well, let's look at this. And I'm same way. Right. I'm like, look at this document, look at this document and let's mm -hmm. analyze it and stuff like that. But right. they don't realize that so much of this for, for these people that are jumping on the bandwagon is not even, they don't even care almost right. what the, what the evidence is. I mean, yeah, they do, but, mm. um, but that's not the important thing to them. The important thing is how they're feeling right? and why, and when something, um, when this model, um, clicks with their feelings, mm -hmm. um, the women are, that's why the women are interested in it. Yeah. So, yeah. so when we engage with it, we have to engage with, Yes, the male energy, but also mm -hmm. with the female energy, we have to right. engage with it. Both, both. Well, and and see, that's the thing too, is that I wouldn't suggest that one or the other by itself is the way that we should approach anything. Um, you know, I don't just mean if it feels good, go with it. If it makes sense, go with it. Like at the end of the day, uh, and this is part of why I think this topic of masculine and feminine is so important right now, is that at the end of the day, we need to learn to work from both. Yeah. And it's the uniting so of those that's things. That's kind of that my feeling about the temple is because mm -hmm. I've thought a lot about the male and female energy in the temple where you have, mm -hmm. you have Adam and you have Eve. Um, and us women, we are 
we go to the temple and we seem to just like sit in that Eve space mm -hmm. and um, the men are all over here in Adam's space. And, and um, we don't realize that this is, um, this is symbolism and it's talking about, you know, these two energies, the male and the female, and almost like the conscious and the subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. all have, yes. we all have portions of that. So men should be able to put themselves in the Eve space a mm -hmm. little bit and, you know, um, get into their unconscious energy as well. So, um, so I think that we don't, we haven't even captured yet the, just the um, amazing um, things that the temple ceremony yeah. has to teach us because so we haven't true. gone there yet. So true. So true. Well, and I think that this topic, I mean, it's so huge. You're talking about it on the scale of you know, integrating men and women, like men and women being able to understand each other better. I would actually say that that's the third level of integration between these energies. And that the first level is really just me right here because yeah. I have feminine and masculine. Absolutely. I'm actually a very, like I have lived <laughs> my entire life with so much masculine energy. Like I am such a doer. I'm such an achiever. A lot of that came from my dad. I was really close to my dad when I was little. A lot of it comes from when I hear my angels, I've got a lot of men angels. <laughs> and so they, they push me, you know, in their guidance and the way that they minister to me, it's very, it's very much a masculine energy. And so now I'm learning that I have this whole feminine side of me that has been unbalanced my whole life. And the feminine is an energy of being, it is identity. It is, it is who you are. It is being able to sit in a space and not do anything. <laughs> And just by your very presence to be ministering to your family, the way that a mother does, right? A home with a mother versus a home without a mother will have completely different energy, even if that mom isn't doing very much, right? And I don't mean like an abusive, neglectful mom. I mean, you know, just her presence, a, a positive presence, right? For a woman. And so like, there's all of these different, I mean, we could go back and forth for days. I wrote a long list last week. God gave me a list and had me divide it out, masculine, feminine, of like 50 different parallels, that ways that we see them. And when you have someone, an individual who's integrated first between them and God, I think it's men with their heavenly father, women with their heavenly mother. And then taking, building on that relationship to come into unity, my body and my spirit my masculine and feminine is now balanced. And then you can start to work outwards. Then we start to impact our spouse, our family, our church, our broader communities, the world, right? And that's the thing about the priestesshood is that it's not going to be a top-down thing that's masculine. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's going to come that way. It's going to come from women and men, right? Who recognize that there has been an imbalance here and they take a personal responsibility to connect with God and begin to heal that. And yeah, and you know that. So it also goes along with um, my interactions with Michelle, also because um, when when um, Brian Hales went on Steve Pinecker's show to talk about Michelle's uh, work, uh, he took a very masculine, authoritative approach to um, engaging with her work, and um, so that's. I think that's one reason why I got involved in this whole situation is because I wanted to show what the problem with, because mm. many people didn't see the problem with that, you know, mm. they thought, well, he's, you know, he's got his own opinion and, and they didn't see when, even when Steve came on and gave an apology, they didn't see the problem with the apology yeah. you know, because it was all wrapped up in this male energy mm -hmm. and I wanted to show you know what the what the real issues were with that you know mm -hmm. so uh, and I think it had a lot to do with the male female and then yeah. and then people still didn't understand because they're like oh you're making it all about you know about it's misogyny but yeah <laughs> and yeah so I wasn't trying to do that necessarily so that it was misogyny but it was more like you're saying the male energy it could have come from a woman this mm -hmm. exact same way Mm -hmm. Um, but it would have been connecting with that authoritative, you right. know, dismissive energy. Yeah. Um, so. And see, that's the hallmark of either of these. If, if they're in balanced in, in a single individual or in a broader group, yeah. there are, there are fruits from that. 
and they're not good fruits necessarily. And so in our world, our world is a very masculine world. I imagine that there might be other earths out there in the ether that are very feminine worlds, but ours is a very masculine one. And I don't have to say that for anyone to know what I'm talking about. But if you have a masculine that is unbalanced, that, that is not informed by the feminine, it inevitably will devolve into tyranny. Like Hitler's Germany is the best example that I can think of, of an unhealthy, unbalanced masculine, where it's just that authoritative hierarchical, I will destroy whatever is beneath me kind of thing, because a hierarchy is a real thing. God, Jesus Christ, Adam, the patriarchs, that's a real thing. Um, but theirs is a hierarchy that's not based on subjecting what's below you. It's based on sacrificing and serving the people that are below you. And Jesus Christ is a God because he was willing to descend and suffer more than anyone else. So it's it's inverted, right? It's flipped on its head. And I did an episode with my friend Todd about this. So if you're interested, you can go and listen to more of that. Um, but it goes in the other way too. If there's if there's no structure, then if the if if the hierarchy is done away with and we just have a ton of female energy, it becomes chaotic. It becomes like a flood, right? Like we will just women, women are so powerful. Like we will just like burn that. the world. We will like burn flood. the world down. <laughs> Um, and I think that that's a really literal thing. And so, well, what do you do? Because we don't want chaos and we don't want tyranny. We want both. And so you have to find starting in here, this beautiful balance of, okay, like I recognize that there is a God above me and there's a God inside of me. My spirit is an ascended being that is experienced, that is powerful. And it is, can, I am going to connect it to the spirit the light of Christ, right? Jesus Christ. I'm going to connect that in. And then all of a sudden I have all of this abundance and I have God's worth worshiping above me. And it, it's just, I mean, it changes everything once you start to incorporate those things with each other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can see it in the world around us, how we are very unhealthy, mostly on the masculine side right now. Um, and there are, there are people who criticize the church and say that the church is and it is, it is an unbalanced hierarchy right now. Um, I have friends and people that I know who have said, this is all corrupt. It's not like I'm going to, I'm going to leave the church and they, and they, and they leave and they leave God. And a lot of times I see them chasing things like kind of new age sorts of things, because honestly, there's a lot of feminine there. There's a lot of yeah. types there of heavenly mm -hmm. mother. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not good <laughs> and also it's a mix, right? Everywhere is a mix. This whole discussion we've been talking about, you can't get away from it. Yeah. I mean, um, I think those things really appeal to you when you're feeling that imbalance, then yes. you, you're trying to get back in balance and those things are going to definitely. You do, you do. And, and I think that they are, it just, it, I, I think that they are so beneficial and God has led me to a lot of those things, but it requires that balance, right? It requires me remembering I have a God above me. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. It's a fun, it's a fun exercise to do, but I do think that more information is coming. A lot of people are feeling it. Uh, people have great hesitancy about a topic of a heavenly mother and the divine feminine, because they recognize historically that false goddesses have kind of been the order of the day. They see that because we've suppressed the real goddesses <laughs> and the real goddesses were deleted. And so they're left with these examples of sensual, devilish, manipulative goddesses. Um, and, and I think it strikes a lot of people as fearful and as something to be aware of, which of course you should, but we have to remember that there's only a counterfeit if there's something real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we don't want to throw out the real just to avoid the counterfeit. We have to hold them both and discern. Yeah. Really good points. So that was a lot. You got me, yeah, you got me on a soapbox, but that's the yeah, thing that God's great. put on my heart, which I never, ever so interesting. So okay. I'm excited to see what, um, what continues to come. And I appreciate strong women like you and Michelle and Maxine and so many of our community. I feel like we have an incredible base of women who are feeling this call to righteously, unselfishly, without guile, seek after their mother. And I really think it's beautiful and a powerful movement and one that's inspired.
Yeah, I find it so interesting too, especially being the age that I am and seeing that because these cut things just come in waves. So they talk mm -hmm. about in in feminism in just general, they talk about the first wave of feminism, mm -hmm. second wave. And mm -hmm. the same thing with Mormonism almost, because you know, I see that, you know, these women they're just a little bit older than me starting, you know, the Heavenly Mother searching for Heavenly Mother and then kind of um, being a wave and then just also being tamped down a little mm -hmm. bit and then coming mm -hmm. back. And then, you know, it's been gone for a while and now there's mm -hmm. a new generation of women that are um, thinking about it and um, wanting to um, bring it out. So um, yeah. hopefully this will gain some momentum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe there's an appointed time like, I believe that there really will be more revelation, more light and truth. And the question is just, will our hearts be open? Will we be prepared to accept more? Or are we going to say that I have enough? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. I feel fun. like we had two conversations. Uh, yes. It was great. Maybe several. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We'll have to keep in touch, but thank, thank you so you. much for your work. It was really enjoyable to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you just reading the scriptures or have you learned to search them? If you haven't switched to using scripture notes, you haven't discovered the power of a tool designed for searching the scriptures. This incredible tool allows you to pull together search results from the standard works, apocryphal texts, and freedom documents into a collection you can study from. Digging deeper with instant references to Blue Letter Bible, the LDS Citation Index, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and more. You can even import your gospel library notes as well. Sign up now for a free trial at scripturenotes.com.